Yes, hello, um, guys. As I shared earlier, um, we, we opted to have an exclusive interview with Chris Bates all the way from Bitland Global. And um, Chris happens to be somebody who is so much um, dosed with information when it comes to the blockchain technology. And he's a, he's a leader in this industry as well. And we are so glad to have Chris today on the EBA Phoenix TV. As part of our live interviews, we are granting those that we believe are giving up value in this industry. So without wasting much time, I think, um, Chris, if you're here, if you can hear me, how are you doing? Excellent. Thank you for having me. Yeah, that's Much okay. appreciated. You, you're most welcome. I think we have already informed a whole lot of people about you, but it is going to be more, it's going to be much more ideal if you once again use this opportunity to actually tell us something about yourself. Perfect. Um, so my name is Chris Bates. I am the Chief Security Officer and President for Bitland Global. Um, I have been in the cryptocurrency scene for about seven years now. Um, I got in around 2011 uh, because I was living in a country that was um, heavily uh, censored and having a lot of uh, internet censorship being um, let, made legislation. Uh, so if anyone's not familiar with what happened in Turkey in you know, 2013, um, that's where um, a lot of the uh, government clamped down on internet freedom happened in the Middle East. Um, and I just happened to be living in Turkey for, around that time. So this is where um, being able to see firsthand what it's like to have censored, restricted internet uh, made me more inclined to participate in this movement. Um, I've been in the crypto community for um, educational purposes and trying to help people understand what's actually going on in the movement. Um, and obviously, things have evolved uh, drastically in the last few years. So this is where what I'm trying to do is kind of be um, an informative agent that helps people understand what's going on um, and help them understand where they belong uh, in that revolution. I think that was an awesome description and also an information for us to actually get to know more about you. And you mentioned Bitland Global. Would you want to tell us something about Bitland Global? And before you do that, I have to also inform all our viewers. Actually, today, we are going to talk about an interesting topic, which happens to be blockchain and a solution for Africa. As you heard, Chris happens to be an educationist like all of us. And... He's so much passionate about getting the world out there. And today, our subject matter appears to focus so much on blockchain and its solution for Africa. But then, um, you mentioned Bitland Global. Would you want to actually tell us more about Bitland Global? What is this about? What is this uh, mission you are on? And, you know, stuff like that. Because when you ask me, you know, um, with EB Phoenix, and we have been, we stand out to be one of the largest educational platforms in Africa. And we've been simplifying this revolution for many. So, like, basically, a whole lot of people already know, and they are watching. And I would also want to learn what Bitland Global, just like um, many others out there, would want to actually know from you directly. The horse is mine. <laughs> Perfect. Well, um, so what initially happened was uh, Bitland was started by Nari Gamba Mansubu, who is a Ghanaian national. Um, he lives in Kumasi, still lives there. Um, but he initially started Bitland because he had heard a lot of um, information about the blockchain and how it's going to help Africa and, and bring Africa out of this like um, poverty age. And he had a lot of problems with how it was being framed because um, the rhetoric that was being touted wasn't really lining up with reality. Um, so, when he was hearing it, he was, he was living in a place where um, they didn't have electricity uh, two out of seven days a week. So when people are saying, oh, blockchain is going to come and help all this, his response was, 
you can't have blockchain if you don't have internet and you can't have internet if you don't have electricity. Um, so there were some major infrastructure problems that he saw with um, implementing blockchain tech. So from the beginning, Bitland has been trying to build a practical approach to implementing blockchain that takes into account um, a lot of these places won't necessarily have the physical infrastructure to, to actually support it. So we've been trying to help educate people on the benefits of the potentials of blockchain, but also the practical um, implications of actually implementing that technology, because there are things about the promises of blockchain uh, that are not necessarily going to be realized unless a pragmatic approach is taken to implementation. Um, so this is where, in many ways, education is one of the most important aspects of getting things implemented. So this is kind of why we want to work with uh, organizations like your you know, eBitcoin, uh, ex, you know, to make sure that people get access to the proper information, um, but also understand that everything that is out there is not necessarily accurate. And also um, many people are presenting things to uh, capitalize on a potential uh, what would be seen as humanitarian cause, but then they're not, not actually executing on those humanitarian causes. Because um, just as an example, uh, Bitcoin is about to be 10 years old next year, and many of the uh, causes for Bitcoin's implementation have been um, uh, to Africa and a lot of people have been using remittances to Africa as one of the main um, use cases for Bitcoin but when I look at the people actually benefiting from Bitcoin and benefiting from the infrastructure most of them are, are not actually Africans and this is one of my big problems with um, crypto at large is they will use Africa as um, their humanitarian cause as why they need to execute all these things, but when it actually comes to helping the people and getting the infrastructure implemented, there's a major gap. And this is where what Bitland is trying to do is actually um, bridge that gap. We're trying to close that last mile because the last mile on the ground is the most important. And we're trying to make sure that the people who are supposed to benefit from this technology are the actual people benefiting. And I think that is um, something that's quite an interesting um, statement you made as to those that are supposed to actually benefit from the technology are not getting. And I, I, I just, I, I need kind of, a, I kind of need an elaboration to that as to um, if they are using it every day and people, I know like currently if you look, if you consider the world's population, less than let's say a percent one percent are actually involved with this technology we you and i are talking about today and if you look at a continent like africa mm -hmm. um when it comes to technology stuff that has to do with technology it takes time for the people to actually try to understand it not for so many factors but um because of how they grab information and uh, especially something that has to do with technology it is very difficult for the people. They, they, they need time. They, they feel like um, it's, the timing is not right. Or basically, they have not identified major stakeholders as being a part of such an evolution and something that is actually a big trouble when it comes to Africa. So if you make a statement that those that are actually supposed to benefit from something like Bitcoin, on the blockchain technology are not really getting the benefit. Don't you think that it is rather those that are using it are not capitalizing on what it really is and some of the things that they can really do with the technology itself, isn't it? Or maybe you feel like some people are, yes, of course, the world, people are, some are um, basically having an advantage when it comes to technology over others. When you look at infrastructures like the internet itself, 
In Africa, there are a whole lot of people that don't today have access to internet. And imagine somebody that don't even understand what the internet is, and you are trying to let the person understand a technology being evoluted on the internet becomes a very big problem. See, the person don't even understand the internet. He's not using the internet. And on set, you want the person to actually use something that is evolving around or on the internet. You see, that is a very major problem. So, and um, if the person is using it and it's not capitalizing on the full potential, don't you think it has something to do with the person's decision rather than trying to blame somebody else for that? No, I agree um, a thousand percent. And part of it is um, when you're talking about underrepresented populations that don't have access and are not included, um, they're not going to have fair access to information. We're talking about information asymmetry here. So um, when you're talking about a group that is actively not invested in, if you look at um, pretty much all of Africa, there's no real internet, not because the country is not technologically advanced, it's because there hasn't been any investment in getting the technologies um, accessible. And this is the big problem where when you look at Western approaches to investment before uh, in a post-colonial Africa at large, what happened was many of the governments had been disrupted and corrupted actively by Western influences. So then when the Westerners would talk about um, these countries are not trustable concerning um, channels of investment, well, it's mainly because the West had disrupted those government infrastructures to make them untrustworthy and then turn around and use that as a logical reason as why they're not investing. Um, so this is where that's one of the reasons why we're trying to focus on education first because understanding that the people who will benefit are at a an information disadvantage we need to make sure that they get access to the proper information to understand the potential benefits to understand how that technology can impact them so they actively absorb the technology before they get put in this position where they become colonized through digitization yet again because if african countries are not creating their own blockchains they're not creating their own digital infrastructures they're going to get colonized again all their data will be owned by extra national companies they will be owned by non-African entities, and then Africa will be beholden to the uh, organizations that control the digital transfer of data. And that's what I'm afraid of, and this is why Bitland is so adamant about educating governments as to why African governments need to be building their own blockchains and not using uh, third-party blockchains, because in fact, we don't know who created Bitcoin. That's not a problem, but if Bitcoin was created by the United States government and they do in fact have um, a large control of mining operations at any point, they could decide to cut off any given country um, in the same way that China cuts off access to Facebook to its citizens. So if that happens, any African country that decided to make Bitcoin their basis of their economy would be um, shit out of luck and put in a situation where they're um, open for exploitation. So this is my main reasoning as to why. It's not that I don't, uh, it's not that Bitcoin shouldn't be part of this scenario. It's more so that no African government should give up sovereignty over control of its local currency especially in light of the threat of digital colonization is a thousand percent real and African governments need to make sure that they are not put in a spot where their citizens are um, consumers of uh, uh, something that is not being uh, sustained locally. I think this is actually an, an interesting um, subject you just mentioned because um, in some African countries today, so. Uh, most of the governments are, resi are being resistant to the technology and not accepting the fact that this technology is actually here to stay and they 
they are kind of dependent, just as you mentioned, like um, indirectly being colonized by the Western world in terms of information and decision making as to they want to see some countries doing A, B and not trying to make decisions on their own. And this is something, in fact, um, our leaders need to actually put their attention on And it's not easy. You know how Africa sometimes is when it comes to our leaders and decision. Now, assuming, um, you know, there's some, some of these things, sometimes when you try to talk about it deeper, sounds too political to some that don't even understand what you're talking about, the subject, when it comes to government matters. Mm -hmm. Now, let's assume uh, everybody now understands the blockchain technology or the masses we need them or their attention or to invite their attention onto this evolution. Now understand it or maybe now they've got to hear some information about it. What are some of the like impend or pending solutions aside getting the education do you think blockchain can do? Now, if um, let's say, if Africans need to come out with their own blockchain system, yes, that is a very big deal. And not just about Africa. You give out an example, which has to do with, um, let's say, if the US government is the one behind Bitcoin and today it decides to actually shut down some services around Bitcoin because they have the, the um, when it comes to the mining power, they can choose to do whatever it is that even though Bitcoin happens to be decentralized. Now, this happens to affect not just Africa. There are co continents like Asia. There are con continents with mm -hmm. amazing countries with masses of numbers that are also going through what Africa is going through. So I think this is actually a general talk which needs everybody's attention. And I am sure some of these interviews goes a very long way for people to watch and get to question themselves why we are doing this or A. Now, presuming this education is done, people have gotten to actually understand what you want to communicate to them. What are some of the extra things that uh, we could do or can be done to provide a more sophisticated solution for Africa with the blockchain potential itself? So I think one of the biggest <laughs> Excuse me. One of the biggest problems with what's happening is that the technology is effectively becoming a deity. And what I mean by this is that people are putting their faith in this technology, thinking this technology is going to fix everything. Yeah. Um, when in reality, people are the solution. We have to understand that we have to establish trust mechanisms to um, be able to connect with people. The only way to solve our problems is if we learn to trust each other. Africa has to um, become the African Union that the AU was intending. There has to be uh, movement between borders. There has to be um, economic opportunity between countries. There has to be economic inclusion that does not restrict trade between borders. That let has to go. go let me chip me something. I think a quick one over here before you continue, talking about um, economic independency with, um, for example, the African Union lies on uh, maybe a single dependent currency with some of the leaders, independent leaders in Africa tried and they failed. Don't you think Bitcoin or the blockchain itself has some of this potential to unite Africa? No, no. Wise? no I don't. And mainly because... Bitcoin is agnostic, meaning Bitcoin does not care about anybody. African Union needs a, a currency that cares about the African Union. You cannot have an agnostic currency as the staple for a, a union or a nation. That is counterintuitive. It's also counterproductive. And this is one of the biggest flaws with um, the uh, theoretical application of Bitcoin to a lot of these countries or unions as an international agnostic platform um, Bitcoin is great but for an any any individual organization country or union it's absolutely not good because of the fact that it is agnostic and that it doesn't care about those groups and that is exactly why African Union should not depend on um, an agnostic protocol whatever African Union decides is their currency or protocol should be in fact in benefit at the core for the African Union. And that is why I don't believe Bitcoin is good for 
have you by chance, have, can you... have you by chance made any effort to have this message, this your voice reach uh, maybe the, the, the right channels where maybe you could invite your attention to what you're thinking about? Have you made any effort on that so far? Absolutely. Um, we've actually made a lot of great progress getting our, um, our message heard by the proper government officials. And I think that's why you hear a lot of the news you do out of like the Nigerian government, for example. Um, it's not that they hate blockchain or hate cryptocurrency. It's that they've actually heard our message. They've heard um, the digital transformation pitch where we're trying to say, you guys need to build your own. You need to have a Nigerian. You need to have a Ghanaian blockchain. You need to have an Ivory Coast blockchain. Um, so this is where um, we've put those messages in the proper channels to have it reverberate through the rest of the African community. Um, but as well, I think that is actually why you're hearing a lot of the news you are that's not necessarily pro Bitcoin. It's not it's definitely not pro Bitcoin, but it's not necessarily anti blockchain coming in. And I'm not going you know, there's NDAs in play not too much. Um, but there's a lot of things happening where we are directly in contact with governments that understand um, the long term potential. And one of the best things about this is when we're going to governments, um, we're pitching that the people should be the consensus mechanism. There should not be a consensus mechanism that's disconnected from the people. The people should be the consensus mechanism. And this is what we've been pitching to governments. Wow, that's, that sounds, you know, quite very interesting. And um, I'm lo looking forward to those right channels actually right, um, acting correctly or rightly on such information. It's very important. Everybody wakes up as this is much more bigger than all of us are actually thinking. And I believe with time, people will get to, you know, it's not, it's not that been easy. When we got started with all the it's all these stuff, you know, it was just so hard. And now if you look at the, how people are actually embracing it, especially in Africa, looking at the fact that remitting funds out of the country, sometimes it's, it's a big problem. Um, getting hold of what, you know, having total control of what you have, sometimes those are a very huge problem. And this blockchain is being evolved on the continent, everybody anywhere in the world, I think it's a very big problem. And it's sometimes not just in Africa, because even in Europe, I know a lot of people are very kind of skeptical about this blockchain technology and there's still a lot to be done. Now, uh, Chris, one thing I would want to actually know is that, do you think by any chance, um, anybody can say, hey, we woke up one day, yes, we all believe Bitcoin is, and we know Bitcoin is much decentralized and it's, impossible for you to say you're going to shut Bitcoin down. And we've seen uh, governments coming out with new regulations, new stuff that have to do with their own people and stuff, and it matters a lot. But do you think in your own objective that you, you would wake up one day to see this technology no more? Anything's possible. I mean, if the internet, um the internet is not a unified entity, obviously. Um, but if one day um, the electrical grid stopped working for whatever reason, you can't access the blockchain. So, yeah, it, it's one thing where, um, you know, you look at Puerto Rico. Uh, they have a major power outage in a large swath of Puerto Rico. So those people can't use the blockchain there. So I... I don't think that that scenario is as crazy as it is made out to be in the sense of, yeah, just go to Puerto Rico. Those people can't use the blockchain as easily as they're, you know, the, the blockchain community is saying, oh, the blockchain will make Puerto Rico into a utopia. Well, I'm sure there's a million people in Puerto Rico that would disagree with that statement, but they can't access anything right now because they have no power. So they can't join that conversation. Wow, that's a very serious problem. And talking about internet and blockchain, don't you think even without the internet, the blockchain still can survive? Because even before the internet, there have been 
technologies like the Bluetooth, the infrared, you know, the SMS node protocol and all that. I think some of these stuff should make the blockchain work even without the internet. And I know electricity is very important. So oh, let's absolutely. have access to electricity and all that. Do you think it is possible? Absolutely. No, I think you're spot on um, with that understanding that the blockchain is actually going to have to move off the internet um, more to near field communication and um, uh, inter intra device communication rather than relying on the internet as the yes. main layer. So no, I think you're spot on. Well, that's interesting. And um, uh, I don't know, uh, aside what we discussed, I think you see solution never end is every day you wake up and there are new solutions to new ideas that you know the more you're trying to solve a problem but do you think um what are some of the extra things you think need to be done and i think this interview had been very very detailed with all that information but i want more because i i want to learn more you know <laughs> we'll do it next time yeah we'll uh, do this again and i definitely want to um, you know, there's the potential for Bitland to partner with your organization so that we can make this a regular thing. Uh, and that's kind of the goal is to make sure that we can establish um, educational outlets or partnerships with people like yourself so that people get access to this information. Um, so I want to thank you for giving me the time to speak to the people and we will definitely do this again. Yeah, most definitely. And thank you so much for appreciating um, for also responding to our invitation. We also appreciate it so much. And uh, as you said, we'll, our doors actually at EB Phoenix is always open. And we also open to new ideas, leveraging on more in interesting information and all that. So anytime, any day, our doors are very much open to Bitline Global. And we're looking forward to doing more of this. And education matters a lot. And our vision is actually see blockchain reaching every household in Africa, which I know is not easy, but it is easy when we keep on keeping on. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time today, bro. And I'm um, looking Thank forward you. to seeing some other time on this interview again. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye.